Uh, it's a pleasure to follow my honourable friend uh, for excellent contribution uh, from Upper Ban. Uh, and I guess in doing so, I need to reflect on the point that the right honourable member for Shetland and Orkney made. He made two points that I substantially agree with. The first is the, the range of voices uh, within this debate from Northern Ireland and the positive aspect that that brings to deliberations uh, within this House. So I say that acutely knowing that I'm following a colleague of mine. You would think, that for goodness sake, we've just heard six minutes of that. Are we going to get another 10 or 15 or 20 from the big lad? I promise I will try to, uh, try to give a an alternative uh, reflection, but he is right, and I do believe that the 2017-2019 Parliament um, was greatly inhibited by the curtailed voices. The, there was no range of voices from Northern Ireland, save for uh, Sylvia Herman, the Honourable Lady, as then was for um, North Down. That's not to say I agree with everything or I agree with the other contributions, but I think this House benefits from uh, that range uh, of reflections. I also just want to make the point that since there are a range of uh, voices now in Parliament from Northern Ireland, it's still important that the other parties do engage uh, with us as well. Um, it would be a shame to think that you've now got a buddy or a mate uh, in Parliament, Mr Deputy Speaker, so there's no need to broaden your own horizons because that similarly would be uh, a foolhardy mistake. Uh, so I look forward to the continued engagement uh, with the Right Honourable Gentleman. And I think the point that they also made about the fact that there is widespread political agreement uh, for the progress of this second reading uh, today does highlight indeed that it, it probably isn't that significant uh, <laughs> an advancement uh, that the provisions contained within this bill uh, take us so far and they make some changes but they aren't significant uh, in and of themselves. It is appropriate however that there are advancements to new decade, uh, new approach and in a legislative sense it is appropriate uh, that these aspects are before us Today. I think it's right uh, that we do reflect that this is non-emergency uh, progressive legislation. It is nice for me as a Member of Parliament, having been here for six years, having seen hugely significant issues affecting the people of Northern Ireland being rushed through this chamber in a three or a four hour process with second reading committee stage, third reading. None of that's appropriate, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I do think it has been important to recognise how this is progressing and is intended to progress uh, over the months. To come. We benefited not only from the contribution earlier from the Right Honourable Member uh, of Skipton and Ribbon, um, but we benefited from his time as Secretary of State uh, in Northern Ireland um, as well. Uh, I remember the engagement we had in Stormont House around the discussions uh, of New Decade, uh, New Approach, but I remember the personal determination that he had at the time to make sure that politics worked. And I sometimes feel that that's lacking. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I hear time and time and time again from community voices, from uh, sectoral support in Northern Ireland, from business, uh, from public servants, all of whom still have good contact with the Right Honourable Member, all of whom still hugely value the contribution uh, that he made to our society uh, in Northern Ireland. And I do want to say that that energy and drive that was there was predicated on Northern Ireland people working for Northern Ireland people, on supporting devolution in Northern Ireland, on making it work no matter how difficult or how intractable the problems had appeared, in highlighting, recognising and dealing with continual difficulties uh, that we have in our society, in supporting us collectively across the political spectrum to deal with those issues in Northern Ireland. And that's why I think the commitment made last week was so retrograde. There are challenges. We know there are challenges that have been reflected in this debate. But don't turn around. Don't give the impression that if you just can't do it, we'll do it for you. And I said to the Minister two weeks ago, he's on the front bench today, I said to him, do not make the commitment that you will legislate on any aspect of NDNA without political consent. Why? Because the political party that you're going to do it for still needs to be one of those political parties that needs to work with other political parties in Northern Ireland. And the only way devolution will be successful in our province the only way we will continue the pathway from troubles to peace is if we work with one another, is if we trust one another, is if we build a relationship 
based on shared values and a shared outlook as to how we grow as a society. And if the British government or the Irish government or the American government step in at every turn and say, come on, I'll hold your hand. I'm going to take you down this certain path because that's where you want to go. It won't work. And so the short-term gain of what was agreed last week is futile and fundamentally injurious to devolution in Northern Ireland. And so I say at this stage, it's not part of this bill, Mr Deputy Speaker, but it is intrinsic to all that's gone before us, that the government need to recognise, need to recognise that continuing along the path that, you've outlined, that they have outlined would be hugely detrimental to progress in Northern Ireland. And I say that with no joy, none whatsoever. The protocol was mentioned. The protocol is a hugely symbolic and genuinely difficult issue affecting all strands and strata of our society. And you'll hear voices at one side saying it's all a disaster and it's all been imposed upon us and you'll hear others saying well you brought it upon yourselves and none of that actually matters at the end of the day for the ordinary consumer or the ordinary businessman or the ordinary member of our community who's striving for the best but see the barriers ahead of them. I heard the Honourable Member for Foyle, I'm glad he's back in since he gets a mention. I heard the Honourable Member for Foyle saying that he was surprised that the protocol featured in the statements made today. Why not the priority uh, of the health service? We first need to recognise the difficulties. We need to highlight the problems and work to resolve them. But make no mistake about it, there was a suggestion there that a focus on veterinary agreement would uh, be significant in terms of the protocol. It is but one aspect. We recognise the challenges in the health service. How do you deal with the challenges in the health service if we don't deal with the grace period that's going to expire on medicines? Was it not the European Union three months ago that sought to trigger Article 16 to prevent the export of vaccines to Northern Ireland? It was. We saw cancer drugs getting approval uh, by our UK medical agency in the last month. But the European Medical Agency hadn't yet quite made the approval, so those cancer drugs weren't being made available in Northern Ireland, a part of this country, constitutional integral part of this country, enshrined under the Good Friday Agreement that all seek to protect. So let's not suggest that veterinary issues alone will solve uh, the protocol. They will deal with the significant impediment of barriers uh, for food and for animal products, but they will not deal with the totality of it. Would that be a way? Of course I will. Uh, Very grateful to the uh, Honourable Member for, for giving way. I do appreciate what he's saying around medicines, and I think it is important that we have a resolution uh, in that regard. And I believe some very good work has been done by both the Euro European Commission and, uh, let me say, also the UK Government in that regard. But on the issue of the veterinary agreement, while I appreciate it's only one part of the equation, would his party join with all other parties in Northern Ireland in making a common call to the government in that very particular respect? I appreciate it doesn't address all of the issues, but surely if all five parties on that one topic were to make that common pitch, it would make a huge difference, and I would expect the government to listen to that. I understand why the Honourable Member is putting forward that proposition, but he's falling into the same trap. That alone will not solve it. If we go collectively as five parties and say, sort out veterinary, the government will. But does that solve all the problems impacting Northern Ireland on protocol? No, it does not. Does it solve the medicines issue? No, it does not. A clamour months ago about steel and a resolution found for the importation of steel into Northern Ireland with an HMRC fix. Did it do anything for aluminium? No. no, it didn't. Does that impact aerospace? Yeah, yeah. The largest private employer in my constituency, uh, a, a huge employer in, in the Honourable Member from North Downs constituency. Something we recognise that despite the problems last year in coronavirus had £1.4 billion pounds worth of an economic benefit to Northern Ireland still employs 6,500 people. Is that on the table for resolution? I can tell you, Mr Deputy Speaker, my disappointment and anger when I got a message back uh, from the Northern Ireland office to indicate, well, actually, the letter was sent to Mr Shesiewicz and it's not going to be added to the agenda. And little change since. And that's before you touch on the constitutional aspects. 
That's before you touch on uh, the democratic deficit associated with the protocol. So let's not just go down the rabbit hole. I'm not saying that we shouldn't collaborate on veterinary checks. But let's not go down the rabbit hole of sole focus on one singular issue when the issues are many and they are deep and they are broad and they need to be resolved. And I say that only, Mr Deputy Speaker, to conclude on this. There are challenges in society in Northern Ireland. There have been concerns around the stability uh, of our institutions in Northern Ireland and the opportunity for progress. And though I recognise them all, I will not lose my passion for progress in Northern Ireland, for all of us, irrespective of our differences, working together in Northern Ireland. It costs me nothing to say that I believe in and agree with commitments that were entered into, shall and will be honoured. But we cannot ignore the huge and damaging impact that the protocol has brought to society in Northern Ireland, to the unease that abounds throughout my community and many others. And we have to buckle down and deliver and solve.